The Shan Hills of Burma, a lawless country in a land known as the Golden Triangle. In these valleys, an army is on the move, and they want the world to play to their tune. The Shan people have been described as beggars sleeping on a bed of gold, for their land is rich in minerals. But today, the gold comes from the cultivation of the poppy. From the poppy comes opium, and from opium comes heroin. From these fields and thousands like them, 2,000 tons of opium are now being released on the world market. When refined, this, the largest ever crop, will make 200 tons of heroin, enough to supply the world for five years and create a new generation of drug addicts. Here, 60% of the world's purest heroin is controlled by one man, the Lord of the Golden Triangle. A rebel army inside Burma, one of 12 armies fighting the Burmese socialist government. But this army is different. What happens here affects the world. They're commanded by a man described as the biggest heroin trafficker at large today. He is Chan Shi Fu, known simply as Kun Sa, in English, Prince of Prosperity. He commutes to work daily with armed bodyguards. He has to. Thailand, Burma and the United States have all put a price on his head. He claims he's fighting a war to liberate the Shan people. America calls him a criminal. Criminal or freedom fighter, Kun Sa is holding the world to ransom. He has established his headquarters at Hamong, the gateway to the Golden Triangle, the opium-rich area of Burma, Thailand and Laos. His plan to control the richest heroin border in the world. At his base, he's planned his campaign. If we're able to conquer the border, we can control all thieves and robbers. We can stop all the fighting in both countries. And I can control 80% of the heroin trade. Kun Sa's large and powerful army is being trained to watch over the drug routes and heroin refineries. He claims that if his rebel state is recognized, he'll abandon the heroin trade for good. I'm a politician who wishes to drive out those who think our homes in our suffering country should be burned. My first aim is to get for my countrymen the same rights as the rest of the world. If I can do this, I will make eight million people happy. But for the world to be happy, I also want to stop opium. The no man's land between Thailand and Kun Sa's headquarters is hostile country. Armed opium bandits operate in this jungle, and Thai government troops have been ordered to arrest any foreigner found here. So after clandestine meetings with rebel soldiers, we secretly cross the closed border to keep our appointment with the general. After a difficult journey through the Shan Hills and being guided by the rebels through a minefield, we arrived at Kun Sa's camp in time for a dawn parade. Kun Sa's soldiers are reminded of their traditional enemies, the Burmese and the communists, against whom they've been fighting for 30 years.
Every morning they chant their freedom song. The soldiers are also told their number one enemy is the police, in particular agents of the American Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA. The DEA, myself and the people of the world want to see the end of opium, but they shouldn't tell lies and mess us about. Instead, if they come and really work to make opium disappear, then it would not be so difficult. <coughs> These young boys are the general's youth brigade. They learn Kun Sa's politics of opium. They are told their general offers to sell his opium to the Americans every year, but America refuses to listen. Since no government will negotiate with him, Kun Sa lets his drugs go to crime syndicates in Hong Kong and America. He claims he has 20,000 soldiers, but many are very young. This boy, Sai Shui, is something of a veteran. He's been here two years already. He's now only 10 years old. He comes from an opium-growing family and wants to be an officer. To rally people to his flag, the general needs the support of the village headmen and religious leaders of the Shan state. So he sent out his soldiers to invite them to a summit meeting. Conveniently, they're also celebrating Shan Independence Day. The Shan never got their freedom. They were just promised it by the British and the Burmese in 1947, but they celebrate the broken promise anyway. Some of the guests have walked for 20 days to reach the camp. They want to hear about his Shan independence plans. Kun Sa himself is half Chinese, and people question his commitment to the movement. The peasants know of Kun Sa's reputation and that he's changed sides many times in the war of the Shan states. But due deference is shown to the general. Today, however, Kun Sa is able to play a trump card Kuan Zheng, Mr. Thunderclap, is the rebel president. Kuan Zheng says he was once asked by Americans to kill Kun Sa for half a million dollars. But he joined him instead, bringing with him his own army and the respect of many of the Shan people. Kun Sa refers to Kuan Zheng as his noble uncle, a man who has brought money and political clout, not to mention credibility, to the Shan cause. If Kuan Zheng sings as well as he leads, says Kun Sa, independence is certain. <laughs>
The singer calls on everybody to join in. Today, he says, let it be five or six hundred singers. Tomorrow, we shall have six thousand. When we have six hundred thousand, we shall achieve independence. Join in, don't be shy, don't be timid, don't be scared. <laughs> I am working for the benefit of the Shan people and the Shan state. So is Kunsa. We have the same aims. I want my country to have peace and prosperity and to achieve independence for the Shan state. So all our objectives are the same as Kunsa's. The joint strength of the two armies of Korn Jeng and Kun Sa poses the biggest ever heroin threat to the West. But Korn Jeng says Kun Sa is not as bad as his reputation. As for Kun Sa, well, the nations of the world have a bad view of him. They call him the Opium King and think he's a bad man. But I've been watching him for over 20 years. And frankly, by appointing him my general, I'm showing my support and saying he's not a man to be disregarded. Entertainment over, the visitors have to attend a lecture given by one of Kun Sa's commanders. <coughs> they are told that the only way to independence is by following Korn Jeng's wisdom and Kun Sa's strength. Even the monks who led recent demonstrations against the Burmese government learned that the only way forward is through an opium economy. Kunsa's guests come from villages like this, Nong Or, 5,000 feet up in a typical opium growing valley. People are poor. Their only cash crop is the poppy. <laughs> Nongor is also the home of boy soldier Sai Shui, who's about to visit, accompanied by his friend and neighbor, Ai Pi. Sai Shui persuaded his friend to join the army last year. They'll learn new skills. And besides, it's the only job around with career prospects. In January and February, they get extra time off to help with the harvesting. Here, opium touches most people's lives. In the village, they don't care about the politics of Kun Sa's army. They just know their sons go away to be soldiers and their daughters marry the soldiers. Then the soldiers come back to guard the crop that is their future. Already some of the opium here has been harvested. Sai Shui's father molds the opium resin and packs it together in weights of just over one and a half kilograms. 
he expects a crop this year of six and a half kilos. He'll probably get about $600, which will pay off his rice debts. These people share little of the wealth that narcotics bring. Half the opium goes to the United States. Once refined down to pure heroin, this batch will fetch over $100,000. After a two-day walk, the boys arrive home. Their last village was burnt by the Burmese troops. Now they live here under Kunsar's protection. Once an opium poppy is cut, it will give up its juice for only three days. Drops of white sap released on the first incision are left to burn in the sun. Few of these farmers have seen the poppy's lethal derivative heroin. They know little of the rising crime rate and deaths attributed to it in the West. They just buy the seeds from Kunsar's traders. Boys like Sai Shui have been brought up with opium all their lives, but it was the British who introduced the poppy to the Shan states 200 years ago. And these fields once belonged to a Chinese opium army who were controlled by the CIA. The seeds of the poppy are planted in the late summer and the flowers bloom from January to March. They're ready for harvesting once the petals fall, leaving only the green pod, now rich in opium sap. When the white sap has turned to a brown sticky mass, it's ready for collection. This year, it's a record crop, but in any farming community, there's usually a pessimist. I don't grow rice because there are no paddy fields here, so I grow opium, but I never know how it will turn out. If it's a good year, I make a lot of money. If it's bad, then I lose. These small packages of opium, measured by the weight of torch batteries, will soon enter the world of organized crime in which Kun Sa says he plays no part. He claims he's merely a tax man, but it's somewhat difficult to see him as a civil servant. I do not collect taxes from the owners of opium gardens. I pity them because they earn their livelihood by physical effort and the sweat of their brow. I collect only from traders. Taxman or drug trafficker, most of the heroin money goes to his army to buy increasing quantities of guns and ammunition. The weapons come from many sources, German guns captured from the Burmese, American M16s, Kalashnikovs, even old weapons left behind by the British. Most are smuggled across the border from Thailand. And the general is very proud of his arsenal. <laughs> At moments like this, Kun Sa is happy. Since starting an armed gang as a youth, guns have rarely been out of his hands. Maybe in Kong Kao, English. This is a British. You are Chiyo Chi. This is a 60 millimeter mortar. Maybe in Anka. This is also an AK. Chiyo Chi 2. G2. This is G2. Jump. Uh, Kunsa has one of the best equipped armies in Burma. Very good. Not very good. Very good. No good. <laughs> why, why is one better? Because uh, you, have, you meet oil all the time for the Chinese. You have to take good care of them uh, and to oil them all the time.
These guns are now needed for his next move, to clear the Thai border of all opposition, to fortify his opium kingdom, and to clear the roads needed to send the heroin to the west. It's really German, but it was made by Thailand. Right. Which, which weapons are easiest to buy? While guns move north through Thailand, heroin travels south. Kunsa recruits 200 men a month to reinforce Shan demands for recognition by the West. If you want all the drugs to disappear from the Golden Triangle, you must approach us, because the Golden Triangle is our land, and we are the owners. Kunsa is keen to show he's approachable. To improve his image, the general now prefers to be seen as a man of the people. The Shan are simple farming folk, just like himself, he says. And to record this moment, his own cameraman is close by. But his almost regal walkabouts are always accompanied by guards, a reminder of his 25 years as a heroin trafficker. And the West is not yet prepared to talk to this self-styled peasant farmer. Conditions here for the general's young cadets are luxurious compared to life in the hills. Running water is piped to the camp. When Sai Shui came here two years ago, there were just a few huts. Now barracks stretch for three miles along the valley to house this growing army. While I'm here, I work in the garden and do many things like carrying wood for the builders or bricks too. I do other hard work as well. I wanted to come here. My father never tried to stop me. As far as military training, it's left turn, right turn, about turn at the moment. But I have many friends here and I'm happy when I'm learning. Sai Shui earns just over $2 a month as a boy soldier. His rice and accommodation are free. Construction of the new barracks continues from dawn to dusk. The buildings are needed for the regular intake of recruits brought from deep within Shan State. These boys are from the opium growing Wa Hill tribe. But they soon learn that here, opium is forbidden. They all know the penalty for smoking it. Death. Recruits are forced to watch the executions of soldiers caught smoking opium. But for the ordinary people, the drug is still a way of life. The Shan call opium black medicine. For many, it's a nightly ritual.
This young man is a poppy farmer, addicted to his own crop. When I smoke, I feel fine, my body feels good. But when I don't smoke, I can't eat or sleep or even walk properly. I am scared of getting cold, but it's really difficult to stop as I am addicted. I have seen heroin once or twice. If I could get hold of some, I would quit opium. But here, there isn't any heroin, and I wouldn't have any money to buy it anyway. Kunsar keeps his army in a permanent state of readiness. Handguns, grenades and automatics are scavenged from many sources. But mostly, he buys them from his supposed enemies. So the soldiers load Thai army bullets into American guns. While some soldiers are conscripted, Many have fled from attacks by the Burmese army on Shan villages. The Rangoon government has been at war with its ethnic minorities for 40 years. Most of these recruits receiving guns for the first time share a common bond, hatred of the Burmese. Some are students who have fled from the cities after recent demonstrations against the Burmese government. This Rangoon University history student, Sai Pan, lost two friends killed by the Burmese troops. I hate Burmese, the occupied nations, and I hate the Burmese government. I don't like the policy of BSPP, by Burmese government. But some people say this army is just uh, trading in narcotics. No, I don't think so. I think once because our general once because our general have tricking but now he don't trick but even if the soldiers want to fight the burmese kunsar has other plans for the time being his army is facing the other way towards the border with thailand where the opium crosses over proof say his critics that he's no freedom fighter Kunsar's army seldom clashes with the Burmese. Some say he's paid them to stay away. Kunsar simply replies that he's learned a few tricks from his former British masters. Uh, you have taught us to have fewer enemies by fighting today's enemy and to come to terms with the probable enemies of tomorrow and the enemies of the day after tomorrow. <laughs> Every day, heavily armed units are moved up towards the Thai border, away from their traditional enemy, the Burmese. They believe that once they have won the Opium War, they will win their war of independence. They're happy with Khun Sa's strategy. In this raid in northern Thailand, the military have arrived too late. The villagers were, as often happens, pre-warned. 
the poppy has been harvested and the opium is already on its way to illicit refineries. But soldiers go through the motions anyway. With nothing else to do, they mercilessly set about destroying the dead poppies. For years, Khun Sa kept his army in northern Thailand. But in 1982, responding to international pressure, Thai border police attacked his headquarters and forced him over the border to Burma. But there the pretense ends. This is a phony war. Khun Sa still keeps houses and wives in Thailand and an accountant in Bangkok. And from the convenient safety of his stronghold, he controls the flow of heroin across the border. General Chavulit Yodmani, the man delegated to stop Khun Sa, advertises the attractions of his country for the Opium King. Over in our country, we, I would say we have better road network and we have a, a better outlet uh, throughout the, the whole world. We have a good uh, airport, uh, seaport, train service or road network. So drug tends to come through or transit our country uh, more than going out uh, the other way. This road is supposed not to exist. According to the Thai government, it's been blown up. In fact, it's the main road to Khun Sa's camp, built by the Thai government. These border police should play a critical role. Their job is to crush Khun Sa. Thailand has received $26 million from America alone for manning points like this to stop him. But there goes the plumbing for his new camp. And there go daily rice rations for his troops. While in the other direction, close by, comes opium. The opium is brought in mule convoys from northern Shan states to border jungle refineries. It's then reduced to the less bulky substance, the purest heroin, known as number four. But there's another commodity, more difficult to hide, which crosses the border in quantity. It's worth more than the millions Thailand gets for drug suppression. The commodity is timber. Having destroyed its own forests, Thailand now needs wood. They pay the Burmese for timber and Khun Sa for protection while extracting it. In the logging agreement, the general stipulates that the Thais do not bring along their American friends. Thus Thailand is secretly trading with the world's biggest heroin trafficker. It's a fact which Chavalit justifies in his own way. Well, we have to buy some woods. That's... Uh normal I suppose but the Thais have signed a second agreement with the Burmese to go in hot pursuit of the elusive general in fact Khun Sa often drops by to see his Thai military chums has Khun Sa passed here we asked yes several times but not very often this year not yet last year he came several times, but he just passed. But Khun Sa is forbidden to come here. He can come, but he must get permission from a senior officer, not of my unit. If the senior officer wants him, we send a message asking him to come down. Uh, 
I have heard that Kun Sa and several leading members of his army can come into Thailand and travel quite freely. If he disguises himself and we don't know about it, then he can probably come in. But if he comes in and we know and we arrest him, we would probably prosecute him. Um, but I, I have heard that he comes down the border road in his car and crosses the uh, border point uh, only five miles from his base. Is that possible? I don't know. I never heard about it because we have not watched that road all the time. But there are which, which road are you talking about? The road that leads from uh, the Thai border to his headquarters. At uh -huh. We try to cut it off right. and he, he repair it again. Right. And then we try, we will, we will cut it off again right. so that he would not use the road. I had never heard that he used that road himself. The Thais do what benefits them. Now that they see the DEA is not giving them any more money, they come and befriend us. If the DEA gives them money, they fight us. If the DEA doesn't give them money, they befriend us again. <laughs> Considerable backslapping goes on in Thailand over drugs control. But what sort of hunt really is going on for Khun Sa? We went to the DEA regional headquarters in Bangkok. They were ready to do an interview in this office, but withdrew at the last minute after considering our questions and sent us a letter instead. Khun Sa has profited from a combination of native intelligence, guile, luck, perfidy, political acumen, public relations, bribery, and appealing anti-Burmese rhetoric to advance himself and his organization. He plays all sides against the middle while he continues to refine and sell more heroin than any other single organization in the world. His prediction that 2,000 tons will be harvested in the Golden Triangle this year is quite real. This would be by far the largest harvest ever in the Golden Triangle. As guests of the Thai government with a very positive history of cooperation for many years, the DEA is not about to voluntarily embarrass our hosts. If Khun Sa was such a notorious trafficker, how could he keep bases in Thailand and freely move goods in and out of Shan State? Would Chavalit answer that? Well, I prefer not to. <laughs> Thailand is the first country to suffer from the flow of heroin. It comes to these Bangkok slums before its onward journey to the rest of the world. The local organizer of the UN Fund for Drug Abuse Control says addiction has leapt by 20%. The official figure is that there is about uh, 300 to 500,000 active drug addicts in Thailand, mostly heroin addicts living in Bangkok. Uh, this means uh, that uh, Thailand will need a lot of drugs to maintain the habits of this huge drug population because Thailand is a success story regarding the reduction of uh, illegal supply of drugs. The Thai side of the Burmese border. In 10 raids on secret jungle refineries, just over 200 kilos of refined or partially refined number four heroin was seized last year. It's a hollow success. Taking the most conservative estimates, 100,000 kilos made it to the west. Apart from American dollars, Thailand receives funding from member states of the United Nations, but the solution is further away than ever. Twelve years ago, the Shan people proposed a six-year plan to eradicate opium from their country. They asked for $150 million and were regarded as blackmailers. Now the opium harvest is up by 300%. The UN representative does not hide his frustration. We will not see a radical breakthrough in opium production before some kind of political agreement has been reached between the government and the ethnic minorities in Burma. Does that mean you think that the Burmese should negotiate with Khun Sa? This would at least be my personal point of view after being in Burma for some time, that this is one of the essential requirements if you are looking for a radical breakthrough in opium production in the Golden Triangle.
With popular support, Kunsar has been able to outmaneuver the world's anti-narcotics agencies with a knowledge, if not complicity, of governments. With 200 tons of refined heroin pouring out of the Golden Triangle, it may be we will now have to listen to the voice of the Shan.